Neil Leach is an architect and professor from the UK. He currently directs the Doctor of Design program at FIU and has also taught at the Architectural Association, Harvard, Columbia, Cornell, IAAC, and SCIR. He is the co-founder of Digital Futures, an online educational platform that operates in 10 languages, a former researcher for NASA, where he developed 3D printing technologies for the Moon and Mars, and a member of the Academia Europea, Europe's leading academy with over 50 Nobel laureates. He has published over 40 books on architectural theory and digital design, translated into eight different languages. He is currently working of artificial intelligence. His most recent books include, Architecture in the Age of Artificial Intelligence, An Introduction to AI for Architects and Machine Hallucinations, Architecture and AI, and Interactive Design Towards a Responsive Environment. I'm sorry I can't speak Spanish, um, but uh, as uh, my, my colleague Alfred, Alfred Jacobi in Odessa would say, the pictures are all in Spanish and also in Portuguese. Um, so today I'm, I'm going to address the theme of the conference directly, the theme of, uh, uh, of accelerated landscapes. Um, um, and I, I think the question of time is so important to the question of AI. Um, uh, I, I, maybe next year we will have some form of direct instantaneous translation, um, maybe next month, maybe next week, it, actually maybe tomorrow. In fact, it already happened in Tokyo um, when uh, they had Zoom. It doesn't translate names like Rem Kohlhaas very well, but it's 80% of the rest right. So, um, and I want to talk about what I, I, I call AI alien, alien intelligence for reasons that will become <clears throat> very clear soon. Um, so just to say, I'm on my own kind of accelerated um, landscape world tour. This is actually it's decelerating. I've had this frenetic activity going around the world, um, and I'm slowing down. That's why right. I took some a nice few days in in Punta del Este. What an amazing place! I never quite understood when I went to Argentina why they were telling me go to Uruguay, go to Punta del Este. I mean, it, the, I expected somewhere in Argentina. Go to somewhere. In, no, they said, go to you put the last day. Now I've come here, I understand exactly, exactly why. So I want to thank you, um, especially for the warm welcome. When I say warm welcome, I, I mean it because I was in, when I was in Warsaw, um, it was snowing. Um, it was exactly the same temperature, um, 27 degrees, but it was 27 degrees Fahrenheit there, and it's 27 degrees Celsius <laughs> here. Um, so anyway, um, so I'm going to just start off, I'm showing you, I'm sure you've all been doing this using Midjourney and DALI and generating all these images. Um, so, but this is just kind of a, a backdrop and, uh, um, and what I'd say is that AI is more than just this, it's more than ChatGPT, it's more than these diffusion models, much more. Uh, and I want to talk today really about the kind of GPT in, in, in ChatGPT um, and, and much, go much, much deeper. Maybe I could just briefly outline my uh, position in terms of, of, of AI. Um, a few years ago, I was writing a book um, for Bloomsbury, and over the summer, um, I, 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 at the end of the summer, I suddenly felt, on the final day, I feel compromised. I feel like Elon Musk. This is something that is both incredible, and of course, Elon Musk is working with it in Tesla and SpaceX and, and Neuralink and so on, but also terrifying. Um, and uh, so I persuaded my publishers to, uh, to, to divide it into two books, one with a white cover, like The Angel, The Good Side of AI, and one uh, with a black cover, The Black Mirror, The Dark Side of AI. Um, and I mean, to be clear, there's nothing either good or evil about AI. It's just a tool. And like any tool, um, you can, it depends on who uses it and for what. So I can use a kitchen knife to cut up my vegetables and I can also murder you with my kitchen knife. But so far, no kitchen knife has ever been convicted of murder. It's not, therefore, it's not the fact that it's, uh, it's evil. Rather, I think that it is so amazing 
it is terrifyingly amazing. And every day I get even more alarmed by AI. And, and what I want to do today is to present you, the main thrust is to present you not what architects are thinking, not what, what, what we're doing, but actually what the people who, the godfathers of AI, people like Jeffrey Hinton, the people who really know about AI, what they're saying, because they are a little terrified by AI, and so am I. So this is a kind of bit of a roller coaster, um, um, both good and bad, both the white and the black. Um, um, what I'm not going to do today, uh, and I've <clears throat> been talking different versions of this in the, around the world, and this is a particular version focusing on, on, particularly on the question of time and acceleration in terms of time. I'm not going to talk about uh, the, the threat to jobs and things of AI, about AI. I, I think it's going to change completely the profession and discipline of architecture. There is no question, and it's going to have an impact on jobs, but there's no time to talk about that in this time. Um, it's going to be about, the presentation is going to be about an hour, um, but maybe afterwards or something in the questions, we can maybe talk about uh, these things. Um, so I, there's so much to talk about in terms of AI, and, uh, and I'm just going to limit myself to, um, to uh, introducing it and then really trying to dig a little deeper to, to, to say why um, uh, uh, we maybe need to be a bit alarmed by it. Some of these photographs, these are from Japan, as I was, this is from Germany, uh, from, from China. Um, this one, next one's from Hong Kong. As I was going around the world, I was doing, generating images to do with that, and eventually went to uh, the Middle East, um, to Cairo, um, which was incredible. Luxor, and this is kind of sand dunes and the theme of Zaha, and so on. Um, and then after Luxor, I went to um, Poland, where instead of sand dunes, we got snowdrifts, um, and it got very cold. But uh, anyway, um, <clears throat> so it's it's not going to be a theoretical lecture. I'm a kind of theorist. Um, uh, I think in these days, in terms of AI, you've either got to be a real geek and understand the technology, or you've got to be someone like Yuval Harari with a kind of overview. And I'm giving an overview, but I'm not going to talk too much about theory. I just want to talk about information. This is Punta del Este, at least my image is Punta del Este. Um, and, and just to kind of try and convey as much as I can in about an hour. Um, I think there's one more image to come. So, uh, two more. Um, um, uh, let me just finish. Okay, so there are going to be four sections about what I'm going to talk about today. Just briefly, what is AI? We will talk about AI, but you know, what exactly is AI? And I'm not going to go into that much detail. A brief history of AI. I bought my house in Cambridge in England from, from Stephen Hawking, who wrote a book, Brief History of Time, therefore I kind of like that term. AI and its emergent capability, which I think is a thing we should be focusing on, really, right now, not mid-journey and so on. And then the accelerating future of AI, the way in which the speed, the future is speeding up. So, um, so what is AI? And this is, I mean, the AI is many things. It's a box of tools, it's a disciplinary area and so on. But I quite like this particular definition from Margaret Bowden, um, the kind of grand old lady of cognitive science who wrote this book, a little bit update now, but a very good book, um, 2009 I think it was, on AI. And, and she says, research in AI seeks to make computers do the sorts of things that minds can do, which is important because it makes the connection between minds, between the neural network of the brain and the artificial neural network of AI, because now AI is all about neural networks. There are two areas in which it's clearly not correct anymore. Firstly, AI can do much more than the mind can do. And uh, we all know that, uh, that ChatGPT um, knows 10,000 times more than any one person. And the prediction is that in, by 2030, it will know a, a billion times more than any one person. So clearly it is far superior. And I just want to mention, since we have, we have Angelica, my colleague from Digital Futures, Angelica Pozzi here, when I first became alerted to um, ChatGPT, which was the day after it was, um, it, was, uh, um, uh, it was launched. And uh, of course, it was the quarterfinal between Croatia and Brazil um, in the World Cup. And uh, this guy, he's sitting on the floor looking very disconsolate because he was number five to take the penalty. And he never got, got to take the penalty. 
And Angelica was so incensed by that, she went to ChatGPT and said, who should have taken the first penalty? Because she thought it should have been Neymar. And basically ChatGPT said, it should be the best player taking the first penalty, right? <laughs> and I thought, holy shit, this is incredible, this thing. You know? And I thought, this could be used by an architect. You know, what material should I use for this wall? And, it, and then, this could be used by a non-architect. What material should I use? So all of a sudden, this became very, very clear to me, So thanks to Angelica's uh, uh, to a question about this guy. Um, the second area is really, does AI need to do all the things that, that the mind can do? Um, and I'm going to talk about this a bit later. Does it need to be conscious? The big difference between the, the neural networks of the brain and the artificial neural networks of, the, uh, of, of, of AI is the fact that, that AI um, is not conscious, it's not sentient. We used to think, at least I thought at the time, that it cannot think. In my book I wrote, it has no more capacity to think than a pocket calculator. Now we are not so sure. I want to talk about that uh, briefly soon. Just to say that, there, that what is a little confusing about AI is the, the fact that we, oh, blimey, oh, sorry, uh, we, use, uh, we use the same um, terminology for uh, AI, uh, for, uh, sorry, for neural, sorry, for neural networks as we do for, um, uh, uh, for, uh, for, re for real neural networks, neurons and synapses, and the, the circles are the neurons, the lines are the synapses, and the flow of information from left to right is, right is, is governed by the weights on the, uh, on the synapses, and that can be adjusted through a process called back propagation to allow it to get closer to the final thing. There are normally many, many more hidden layers in this, it's maybe up to a thousand, and that's why deep learning is called deep learning. But anyway, the difference is it's not conscious. Does it need to be conscious? I'll want to address that later. Certainly until recently, if you ask most people what AI was, they would have thought it's this, someone like Sophia, the, the humanoid robot. Um, if you read what those working in AI, AI think about Sophia, the, ro the robot, you would be surprised. They are apoplectic about Sophia. She, it is a complete sham. They really find it completely, I mean, whatever, I wouldn't talk about it now, but I, I'll simply say that if you want to think what AI is, don't think humanoid robot. Think code, think programming. Think software. AI is essentially software, very sophisticated software, but software nonetheless. As such, it's kind of invisible in some senses. So in the future, you are going to be surrounded by AI, but you're not going to be surrounded by humanoid robots. In fact, we are all uh, uh, surrounded by AI, and I guess by now we all realize it, but um, a year ago, very few people realized how much AI there is on your phone. AI is what filters out your spam, it's what uh, finishes off your sentences in Gmail, it's what identifies your friends on Facebook, it's what uh, translates for you on WeChat, it's what allows you to order an Uber, and so on, and so on, and so on. But you can't see it, because it's just software, and therefore, you're maybe not aware of it. So, in my book, I, I make this comment, which um, I really like, because I use the term alien, and I use the term alien intelligence now the whole time to talk about AI. Um, uh, uh, because it, you don't anthropomorphize it. The real risk is you anthropomorphize AI because the terms neurons and synapses are the same we use for human beings and also the word intelligence. Anyway, and my comment is, is as though the Earth has been invaded by an invisible, super intelligent alien species, and you'll see why um, I, I'm happy with that in the future. So a brief history of AI. Um, the Brits have been quite central to this, I'm surprised, but we actually, Alan Turing was the first person to conceptualize that. Um, AI is, is kind of his paper in 1950, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, but the term itself, and Alan Turing sadly never lived to see the day when the term itself was coined, was in 1956 in Dartmouth College in the States, when all the, the greatest and the brightest minds in the States got together to try and solve the problems of AI in two years. And you can see, um, I'm in the middle there, the, oh, maybe I shouldn't use the pointer. In the middle at the back is, is Mar uh, Marvin Minsky from MIT Media Lab, um, Claude Shannon on the right there, um, and uh, John McCarthy at the bottom um, uh, in, in the picture were the survivors. So second from the left on the, in the bottom. The survivors got together on the 50th anniversary um, in 2006. And John McCarthy, the second on the left, was a guy who coined the term. He was never very happy with the term, uh, but as he put it, we had to call it something, um, and they were trying to distance themselves from cybernetics at the time, so they, they invented the term artificial intelligence. It's not very good, it's not artificial, synthetic perhaps, 
And the term intelligence, as I say, is there's a real risk of anthropomorphizing it because you think of it in terms of human intelligence. I don't think that, I think maybe information is probably the right word. For, I don't know, but anyway, um, but we're stuck with it and that's what it is. Anyway, 2006, they got back together and uh, actually there was nothing to show. There was really nothing to show. AI had been a failure. Despite all the hype, they had achieved very little. And what's more, they predicted they would not be able to achieve very much at all in the future. And part of the problem was that um, uh, AI was, it was during the Cold War, of course, and it was, it was been funded by the military. And one of the primary purposes was to translate Russian. They wanted to know what the Soviets were saying. And they found that actually AI was really bad uh, at translating in those days. So they tried to translate, for example, American expressions like out of sight is out of mind. And, and they got, instead they got invisible lunatic. And, you know, there were all these jokes about how bad AI was, right? And they particularly were trashing neural networks. Marvin Minsky wrote a book saying these neural networks are going absolutely nowhere, forget them. So there were five different rival approaches. Um, connectionism, which is neural networks. Um, symbolic, symbolism, which is symbolic AI, which is basically logic. And that was the dominant approach that was being pursued. Um, and meanwhile, there's this other guy, um, uh, Jeffrey Hinton, um, who, interesting character, right? He's the great, great grandson of, of George Boole, of Boolean geometry fame. He studied architecture at Cambridge uh, for two days. He told me this. In fact, I, he'd spent the summer working in an architectural office, and he thought, oh, this is not for me. And I think it took him two days to work out how he could transfer from architecture to another. He transferred to natural sciences, and then did a PhD, um, University of Edinburgh, on, on, on AI, and uh, eventually went to the North Atlantic. He didn't want to go to the States because it was funded by the military, so he went to Canada. Now, his view was basically, because he was interested in neuroscience, was if you want to get AI to work, you have to model it on the brain. So he was pursuing neural networks, even though they were out of favor. In fact, he had to scrub all references to neural networks to get any single paper published. But eventually, eventually, and curiously, it was roughly the time, the 50th anniversary of the founding of AI, around 2006, these neural networks began to work. And they began to work really well. Largely because of the development of, of the GPUs around the turn of the millennium, um, but a number of factors. Um, but the most significant was the vastly, vastly greater computing power and the greatest speed of co computation. All of a sudden, neural networks worked and they worked like a dream. Um, and now, I mean, you think about, this is deep learning is, is the other way of referring to this. Deep learning, um, uh, deep learning is a subset of, of machine learning, a subset of AI. Think of these like Russian dolls nested inside each other. And when we talk about AI these days, we talk about ChatGPT, Midjourney Dali. These are deep learning. So we're talking about deep learning. Um, and that's the revolution that has really begun to happen. Now, shifting a little bit, but keeping in the history of AI, uh, in terms of image generation, it was this moment when people began to realize why Jeffrey Hinton's approach was right. So around 2006, they were working. 2012, there was a competition, ImageNet competition, facial, visual, uh, uh, recognizing image recognition. Now, we take that for granted these days. We have phones and we have facial recognition on our phones. 2012, this did not exist, right? This was really a long way off. Anyway, there was a competition, and Jeffrey Hinton and with his team, using neural networks, wiped the floor and showed that they were much, much better than any other approach. And it was around then that people, thought, thought, people suddenly shifted. Forget symbolic AI, forget logic. Let's use neural networks. And that was the kind of deep learning revolution that began to take off. So what's happening here is that basically there's an image on the left and it's kind of recognizing the pixels are going to be processed through these different hidden layers until eventually it comes out with the notion of a bird. It's never fully convinced. It's 99% convinced, maybe. Um, and that was amazing. Um, there. But the holy grail for, for, for computer science was not to recognize images, it was to generate images. And of course, once you can recognize an image, you can generate an image by simply inverting the network or reversing the flow. So you're able to, um, instead of going from image to, 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 to word, you can go from word to word concept, you go from concept to, to image. Um, which is interesting because it seems to suggest that the process of recognition or theory or interpretation 
is the opposite of generation or design, which kind of explains why maybe most designers are not theorists and most theorists are not designers. But anyway, this is what came out. This completely trippy image, which is called <laughs> Deep Dream. And actually, since we're in Uruguay and certain things are permissible here, there are some papers <laughs> looking at how these are actually connected to the use of certain substances, as we like to say on many speech. Um, so, but anyway, um, what's happening here, you've got a neural net that's been trained on, it's like serpents and things and dogs and an oil lamp or something, and it reads those into everything that it sees. Now, the problem is that it's lost information about where to position these things, so they become, as it were, pose invariant. They're all over the place. Um, but this caused a sensation um, back then, and the first ever exhibition, 2015, um, was held in San Francisco of AI-generated art, was using Deep, deep Dream. Um, but then things changed when this guy came along, Ian Goodfellow, and he was in a pub in Montreal, uh, Montreal, I think it was, yeah, and they was kind of talking to his friends, and they came up with this idea, and they went back and wrote it up, and this produced what we know now, we now know as generative adversarial networks, whereas n there are not one, but two neural networks that are competing against each other, hence adversarial networks. So what you get on the left <clears throat> is a generator that is generating images out of random noise, and then the discriminator is, um, is, ju oh, one second. Um, is judging them against um, a data set, I'm trying to get the cursor off thing, okay, uh, against a data set, uh, a training data set, and deciding whether it's convinced or not. And if it's not, conv it's not convinced, it rejects them. Um, and this effectively forces the generator to improve its act. So you train the generator to, to improve, improve, and, and eventually you take the discriminator away and the generator can produce very good images. Um, think of this a bit like maybe how a, 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 an art forger is producing some fake Van Goghs and the, the art critic's deciding whether or not uh, he or she is convinced by that. Anyway, the result of this was something that produced much, much better work, much better images. This is a, a kind of, I guess they're taken from, ultimately, data comes from you know, images on the, net, on the, on the internet of uh, Hollywood actors and things, and um, produces very, very convincing images. Um, this is a gift, but actually, when you go to the site, this person does not exist, you can generate a completely new image of someone who doesn't exist every time. Of course, that means you can produce fake images the whole time and so on. Um, there's also a site, this cat does not exist, and you can <laughs> do the same with cats, right? Um, so this was the real revolution in many ways. Um, and then in 2019, it's kind of interesting, 2019 is what, four years ago, right? It's not long ago. 2019, I teamed up with Zahedid Architects and uh, Refik Anadol, the now rock star media artist, and we proposed to enter the, to, uh, to curate the British Pavilion at the Venice Biennale, um, and we were sponsored by Google. This was a dream team, dream team. We didn't even get shortlisted, and there were nine people in the shortlist, which just goes to show, well, maybe they were against Patrick Schumacher, I don't know, but anyway, it just goes to show that um, we were getting nowhere. And what we were proposing to do was to hallucinate buildings. Um, but Refik just did it anyway. Um, and he'd been working with uh, Google Artist Machine Intelligence Group, Google AMI, he knew the software, he, had, he was working with GANs, style GANs, and he basically fed all the images he had of Zahadid Architects into his computer and began to hallucinate um, uh, another possible designs. In other words, even though Zahar is no, no longer with us, um, sadly, we can still generate images in the kind of, in the style of, of Zahar, as it were. And eventually, suddenly out of the computer, something emerges that looks kind of quintessentially as though it's been designed by Zaha. Um, and there it is, um, which actually was the image we used for the front, front cover of this book, the first book, mainstream book in the English language on AI and architecture. It wasn't the first book. The first book was by when you heard one of my doctoral candidates, who um, I'll talk about her later, um, who's in Chinese. This is the first one in English. It came out in December 2021. And since then, of course, other things have been happening. Uh, style GANs gave way to other, there's a whole zoo of different GANs, and there's cycle GANs, is, um, was a significant development. We have two unpaired data sets playing off against each other. So effectively, you're breeding, you're breeding solutions. So whereas style GANs was kind of interpolating from a finite data set, it's kind of a form of averaging. This one is a form of extrapolating. You can effectively produce new things by breeding one thing off against another. In this case, it's the work of Cole Pimblau. It's the, about a thousand projects that they're breeding off against geological formations. 
but it could be you know Zaha and orchids or whatever. Um, and this was quite significant, and it certainly um, uh, started taking us in a new direction. That's jumping. Um, and the at the time, this this was the best we had, um, and uh, it wasn't bad. The guy behind this is a guy called Daniel Bolajan. He is the genius um, uh, of AI and architecture. Um, there are a lot of people, and I won't mention their names because I'm collaborating with one of them. They complete bullshitters who claim they know about Daniel Bolajan knows. He's absolutely one of the smartest guys out there. And it, this is the kind of image it produces. Kind of glitchy, not very high resolution. This was hard work. You know, you had to train these things. And, and really, um, uh, and you had to be computationally advanced. It was very, very difficult. I was working with Daniel Bolajan. He was teaching my students, but you couldn't do it. The every, every person, person couldn't do it. Anyway, this was the, what we put on um, uh, the... Uh, front cover of, um, of, of the AD, um, uh, Machine Hallucinations. Um, it was the state of the art. Then something else happened, um, and that is diffusion models. Um, and there'd be, Dali 1 had been around before, um, hadn't been released to the public, and it was producing some interesting things. Then Dali 2 came along, and um, uh, to begin with, it wasn't available to the public. Now, this works in a very different way. What happens with a diffusion model is you, you, you use a Markov chain that generates Gaussian noise that disrupts an image and the, as the image repairs itself, so it produces a new image. So it's very different in that respect. Um, it's also different because it's much easier to use. They're based on massive pre-trained neural networks. Um, you haven't got to know anything about computation. And, and uh, uh, they also produce things much more quickly, three seconds, um, in much higher resolution. And importantly, also, we are, uh, we, they're based on, on text, so prompt engineering becomes the new, uh, the new term that we use. Now, the important thing is, is to understand that AI does not copy. People like Mario Carpo to keep writing, saying it copies. It does not copy. It does not copy. Human beings copy very badly. You know? Maybe you'll see my sneakers and you'll say, oh, I want to go buy a pair of those, and you copy and so on. Human beings... Culture propagates by copy in, in human culture, but, but AI doesn't do that. It searches and synthesizes. I once did a study of Mies van der Rohe's Barcelona, but it may be about 10,000 images. Not a single one was a direct copy of Mies van der Rohe's building at all. They were kind of, you know, variations of um, shape, grammar or something, but not the same. Um, so this one, for example, is, it shows this, an astronaut on a horse. Well, has there ever been an astronaut on a horse? Probably not, um, and yet it searches and synthesizes and gives you a sense of what it would have been. This was really sensational, um, and I was, I was talking about this at the AA May of last year, May of last year, and I was saying, when are architects going to wake up to the possibility of AI? Because they hadn't. You know, it, it, no one was paying any attention. May of last year, no one was paying any attention. Patrick Schumacher was in the audience, and he said, it, that moment's already happened. We've woken up. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, we've been collaborating with Refik Anandol. And Refik had got access to using DALI 2 before it had been launched. And they've been collaborating and producing images like this. Um, much, much better images. Um, and, of course, done in three seconds, much quicker to do, and better resolution. Um, and, you know, a sense of... They're still 2D, but, uh, but they get a sense of three-dimensionality and you get a sense of materiality. Much, much superior, and of course, you know, the rest is history, as it were. Um, so, <clears throat> how do we understand what these things are? Well, my view is this, um, that I don't think we're that imaginative. We like to think we are, but I don't think we are. I don't think it's imaginative at all. We are very good discriminators. Now, this model, even though it applies to GANs, I think shows us really what's happening in terms of the way that, um, uh, that, that we're operating. I mean, it's kind of interesting because, again, looking back at architects, it, it kind of explains how you improve your design by critical feedback. But also, if you're a theorist, you need the kind of imagination of the designer to make your theories more imaginative. Anyway, what I would say is that we think we're good at, 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 at imagination. We're not. We are very, very good at discriminating. Um, I was on the banks of the River Plate last night having a cocktail. You taste the cocktail, immediately you know whether you like it or not, right? Or you go to smell some perfume in Duty Free, immediately you can tell whether you like perfume. We are very, very good at discriminating. You see a building, immediately you know it's like it or not. 
but actually we are not so good in the imagination side. And, and what Midjourney does is throw out these other options. What about this one? What about this one? What about this one? What about this one? And it basically enhances our generative capacity. It, it, it becomes a prosthesis to the imagination and therefore makes us better. Now, as interesting as all these images are, I think they're just superficial. Um, they are, but they are, they're just the tip of the iceberg. There is something interesting about them, and I'll talk about it later, but you know, this is not, they're just a typical iceberg. There are other things happening, not Spacemaker, I'd say, I don't think, I'm not impressed at all by Spacemaker, it's now a former, brought up by Autodesk. I, I once asked someone, I found my book, who was working for Autodesk, uh, what is um, Autodesk, what innovations are Autodesk doing in AI? And he said, Autodesk, innovation? No, Autodesk, <laughs> it acquires, it doesn't innovate. Um, and they're pretty, I'm mediocre, I think, and they were asking me for advice. Can you believe that? Anyway, um, this is the person. This is the person I think you should pay attention to. Um, Wan Yu He, um, she's, uh, she worked, studied at the Bell Lager. She worked for OMA for eight years. Um, in 2016, she set up XCool. XCool is based, means X Plus. Um, and then recently she set up the Western version. And like OMA flips into AMO, Look X is export back to front as it were. And she is the one, uh, I mean, their company has got a few guys, unlike Autodesk, they've got architects who work for OMA, and they've got uh, computer scientists who work for OpenAI and Google working there. And they are doing some amazing things. Back in the day, they started doing this. This building does not exist. This is a long, long time ago. Um, and they now have this, this, they would use the cloud and work remotely. You've probably seen Look X, which unlike, Mid Journey and Dali is um, trained on architectural examples. So you can do this kind of crumpled up paper. Um, I'm sure you've seen the Simpsons version of Frank Gehry <laughs> screwing up a bit of paper. Uh, it, was a mad, it was a mad Simpson written him saying, Dear Frank Gehry, come and design us an uh, uh, opera house. So he's, he gets a humbug and he screws it up and throws it on the, onto the pavement and then looks at it. Frank Gehry, you're a genius. And they, they <laughs> well, this is Tim Fu. He used to work for Zaha. You, you, and you can use LookX, and literally, it just reads it uh, as a, a, and you can do a, a kind of Gehry version, of Morphosis version, a Zaha version, whatever. Renderers are out of a job, right? Um, I won't talk about that today, but anyway. Um, but the point is this, that is just the kind of beginning. And um, what they're establishing is a platform. The moment if you work for Zaha, you might start you know, brainstorming mid-journey, you might go into Maya, then you might go into Rhino, then you go into BIM. This is all gonna be, in two to three years time, the software will come out, it will all be on a single platform. It will go from data to fabrication. And it will be, it'll have everything embedded in, all the building codes, the planning constraints written into it. It'll, have, it'll be monitoring the cost of your doing things. It will have structural concerns, acoustic concerns, environmental concerns, all in built into this thing. It'll be a single platform. That is what's going to transform architecture. It'll be a bit boring, frankly. It won't be very exciting or sexy. It'll be boring, but that will totally, totally transform architecture. What I'm showing you here is a, a actually quite primitive. It's topological optimization. You take these, um, what start off as these rectilinear forms, and you subject it to this kind of process, and it starts optimizing and producing um, what end up being um, uh, uh, kind of Gary-like forms. And what's interesting about th this particular firm is not only have they um, beaten MVRDD and Snowhetta in competitions, um, but they are being asked to judge competitions. I mean, that's kind of scary, right? And all of a sudden, you think, holy shit, this is going to be the future of architecture. So I don't think we're going to have the professions and people with pompous people in bow ties presenting kind of... Um, uh, planning permissions, planning proposals, thing. it'll all be based in data in the future, and it'll be radically, radically, radically different. And what's more, every single client will be asking for AI. They already are developers because they know they're going to get, um, first of all, the best solution, the, the most uh, best return on the investment. They're going to get, um, uh, um, they, won't, they, won't, they won't make mistakes like humans. I mean, just look at chat GPT spelling and art spelling, you know, and it will find hidden patterns in the data. We'll come across that in a second. That will be the thing. And, and well, okay, I won't talk about the, the, the effects on jobs, but it's going to have a massive effect on job. Now, I was, I was speculating because the software they're doing, I thought, oh, I can see where this is going, right? It's going to be very, very easy for developers to have everything laid out and... Frankly, you don't need an architect when you've got these systems. 
But then you don't need a developer because the architect could become the developer, I think. Anyway, there we go. There is a, uh, so this came up yesterday and this was, I, I, I was on my, on my flights, I, I, I texted them. I said, listen, I, I think I know what you guys should be doing because we all live in, in individually designed buildings, right? Totally absurd. Everyone is completely checked different. But meanwhile, we've all got the same iPhones. We've got the same kind of, you know, uh, Philip Stark uh, lemon squeezer and Aldo Rossi espresso maker. These are all mass produced. Why aren't our buildings mass produced? Um, and, you know, we, um, uh, we could sort of uh, end up having a kind of a, a big Bjork Ingels design mass produced with our mass produced Philip Stark squeezer and, our, our, uh, and so on. This makes far more sense. And I was saying, surely this is where we're going to go. And they said, yeah, that's what we're thinking. So this image came out. Now, Lego. That, that's their constant, prefabricated modular systems. Now, you look at it and say, Lego, that's so crude, how stupid, you never get anything sophisticated. I'm not sure you'll get these double curvatures you can see here, but that's their point. Now, Lego's based on the brick, right? Actually, the brick has been what we've been using. We've done a lot of things with bricks. Um, so, I, I, this is where it's gonna go. Wait, just wait, two or three years. That is when suddenly we're gonna realize, holy shit, this is what these guys have been working at all these stuff. They are not telling us about it because you don't, you know, it's all non-disclosure agreements and so on, but I know because uh, when you is, uh, is my doctoral candidate, if I need you guys. So, okay, so um, now we get to the scary bit. Um, okay, so AI and emerging capabilities. Um, uh, uh, Ray Kurzweil had predicted that by the year 2000, AI would beat the world chess champion. Um, and in 1997, Gary Kasparov took on IBM's Deep Blue. Now, nobody, nobody, nobody thought that Gary Kasparov was going to lose. I mean, this was one of the greatest chess players of all time. And nobody thought. There's a history of this, okay? It goes on and on and on. And architects also said, no way is AI going to be better than me. Well, forget it. Okay, it's going to be better than me. Okay. Um, and Gary Kasparov, first of all, he thought it was cheating. Um, and then he realized. And, uh, you know, actually, he took a very positive view. He said, this is a triumph for human beings. We've been thrashed, but we made it. Um, but he makes this comment, which I think is very, very true, um, uh, that uh, we just have to understand that everything we know how to do, machines will do eventually do better than us. Some things don't take longer, but chess, forget it. No way will we be AI at chess anymore. But the real challenge came a few years later. Um, now that was just using the old expert system before deep learning, before neural networks had taken off. 1997 was before that revolution. But in 2016, the next challenge was not chess, but Go. Now, Go, I never played the game, frankly, but it's kind of straightforward in terms of the kind of moves that you can make, except it's infinitely complicated because there are more potential moves in Go than there are atoms in the universe. And if you put all the computers in the world together, you would not be able to um, respond uh, uh, as you need to. So they shifted from expert systems to learning systems. They started using deep learning. And um, anyway, so AlphaGo is a system that's developed by DeepMind of London. Demis Osabis is the CEO, absolute genius, also a Cambridge graduate. Um, and uh, they took on Lisa Doll. They offered him a million pounds if he could beat them. And of course, everybody thought, oh, Lisa Doll, he is like the Gary Kasparov of, um, of chess. And um, uh, of, of go, and um, no one thought he was going to lose. No one thought he was going to lose. But this is what happened. This is after game two. Yesterday I was surprised, um, but today I am speechless. Now, this is game two, because something happened in game two. There were five games, and actually, Arthur Go won four games to one, um, and there were, in, the, in those five games there were a series of what they call slack moves. In other words, moves that Arthur Go was making that um, whose strategic significance was not obvious. In fact, most people thought they were computer glitches. That's another mistake by the computer. Ah, stupid AI. <laughs> right, okay. And the famous one was this one. Now, maybe I can just use the cursor here without doing it. Oh, damn, I can't. Okay, okay. Uh, let me go back one. I can go back, oh, go back one. The, the one that's kind of got the black one with the white, the white circle in, okay. That's the move, unusual. Move 37 on the fifth line, normally it's the third line or the fourth line, it's very unusual. But what happened is that 100 moves later, that black stone joined up with the two white stones to the left and slightly further down 
and won the match. It was though AI, as though AI was thinking 100 moves ahead. And nobody predicted this. Nobody can understand this. Let me just play you what the, what the commentators thought of the move. team was talking about uh, is this kind of, of evaluation uh, value of that. Well, that's a very that's a very surprising move. I thought, I thought, it, was, I thought it was a mistake. But it was no mistake. Um, and this was uh, Lisa Doll's uh, comment on this. Um, AlphaGo showed us that moves humans may have thought are creative were actually conventional. Well, I don't think AlphaGo has been creative, and I don't think humans are creative either, but it's a long question. The real significance of this was it was operating at a different level, a different level to human beings. We couldn't even recognize it. Those of you who've got dogs, I know Angelica's got a dog, uh, dogs can smell or hear a much greater range of smell or sounds than we can. It's off the spectrum. What are they, what are they barking at? You know? What are they, you know? This is what's happening with AI. It is off the spectrum. You know, we don't even notice it. We don't understand it. We can't see it. The dumb, they say, do not know how dumb they are. And even the intelligent don't know how dumb they are. Um, uh, by the way, in, in, I was in, in talking about this thing in, in Korea, and apparently, if you want to say you're someone smart in Korea, you say, you are so alpha go. Um, meanwhile, Lisa Dahl. 2019, he gives up the game of Go forever on the basis that this is an entity that cannot be defeated. This is a presage in that for architects, maybe. Um, anyway, if we think that AlphaGo was smart, um, the next one was, was, was even smart, AlphaGo Zero. And this was the one that actually Wan Yu Her picked up on. Because what, it's, what this could do, not only did it beat itself, beat AlphaGo 100 games to zero, wipe the floor, much better. But it taught itself to play Go without even being given the rules of Go. And you think, holy shit, how do you do that? How do you reverse engineer that process? You know, it does it. But what's more, it did it through a process called reinforcement learning um, over three days by playing 3.9 million games of Go against itself. And you think, that's a lot of games of Go. And I'm not sure if this is going to work this video. Let's just see if it does. I think it will eventually. Um, but when you think about it, it is a hell of a, a lot of games of Go. It amounts to... 20 games of Go per second. And you think, holy shit. No, this is a hummingbird, which is not, okay, it's jumping around a bit, I'm sorry. Okay, this should be, <laughs> there we go, there we go. This is a slowed up version, admittedly, okay? And this hummingbird is beating its wings at three beats per second. Now, talking about accelerated landscapes, um, imagine seven times the speed. Imagine playing 20 games of Go against yourself per second. It is incomprehensible. But this is what gave us a clue about what was to come in the future, which is to say this, um, GPT-4 and so on and so on. Now, what I want to draw attention to is the very unsexy term, large language models, which probably look at and say, that doesn't sound very interesting, and it doesn't sound very interesting. And it is a complete understatement, right? They are not large, they're absolutely gigantic. These are massive, massive pre-trained models based on trillions of bits, on billions of parameters that have actually got surprisingly little code in it, about 200 lines of code. It is the sheer scale and size of this multi agent system that really is astonishing. And it's that that is allowing it the capacity to develop what they call emergent capabilities by which I mean they learn languages. They learn to translate, translate languages. They learn to write code. And I'd always tell my students, well, if things get bad, just go into the world of computer science and become an AI expert, right? So all the AI experts are worried now because it can write code, right? Um, so, um, and, and that's, that's the amazing thing. And, and we don't pay attention to this, but this is the kind of thing that's been appearing in the press recently. Um, this uh, Max, Max Tegmark writes his letter to the Future of Life Institute saying we've got to slow down this development of these large language models because they're getting terrifying. We need to somehow control them in some way. Um, um, and, and then there's, there's, there's Jeffrey Hinton himself quitting Google so he could speak out and tell us why he's freaked out by these things. And we'll play him in a moment. You'll see why he's freaked out. Yoshio Benio, one of his kind of team from, from Toronto, also completely lost. And then the general public beginning to wake up to the fact this is scary, especially in Hollywood. They... They know about these things. Now, this letter was kind of interesting. Um, 
signed by Elon Musk and all these people. Um, now, what you discover is that actually they refer to these at the very bottom. Um, uh, this doesn't mean a, 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 merely a stepping back from the dangerous race to ever larger, unpredictable black box models with emergent capabilities. Now, uh, first of all, the chances of anyone slowing down are zero. Um, Akim used to cycle in the, the German pursuit team. If you ask the leader in the, the, the race to slow down, of course they won't slow down because the competitors will catch up. Or, you know, the Olympic marathon, slow down. No, no one's going to slow down. <laughs> Ridiculous. That was doomed to failure. But it's the emerging capabilities I want to talk about, which is kind of interesting. I don't know whether they're referring to emergence per se, but emergence is a principle um, in kind of the world of biomimetics, biomimicry, which talks to talks about the way in which any multi-agent system, um, such as a flock of birds, begins in a bottom-up way to take on a kind of life of its own, as it were, certain kind of emergent characteristics. So the term emergence was, was written about first by John Holland and then more recently popularized by Stephen Holland um, in his book, The Connecting the World of uh, Ants, Cities, Brains and Software, Making Connections and so on. And here we've got an example of, of that. This is a, in Brighton, you can tell because it's gloomy weather, um, uh, of, of, a, of a flock of starlings coming into roost at night by, by the pier. And this beautiful aerial choreography, um, actually the birds themselves don't know about this. They're just following straightforward rules, like keep a certain distance from the birds on either side, go in the same direction, same speed. But out of it, something begins to emerge, unpredictable and so on. And what freaks out scientists is that no one can explain this. They think it's kind of, they even use the word magic, but then again, Arthur C. Clarke says magic is just science we can't explain yet. Now, so you can observe it, but as John Holland said, you can't explain it. And I've yet to find any scientist who come up with a convincing explanation of emergence. Anyway, emergence is this strange phenomenon that explains the fact they can begin to, in a way, by searching through the data set also and finding all these connections between the data, work out how languages work, look out how co codes work, and start developing in new ways. And, do all these things. And I want to suggest that not only can they learn to, 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 to write and to, to, to write code and things, but also they've learned how to design. Um, um, and what God knows what else they've learned. Um, so uh, Yuval Harari makes this comment that AI has hacked the operating system of human civilization by which it's learned to, to, to write, to compose sentences. And once you can compose sentences, once you can write, you have enormous power because you can persuade people to do things. Um, and he's absolutely right, he's absolutely right. But I would say it's also learned how to design. Um, so this is just, I mean, I put my Instagram there because that's why I post everything on, on this site here. You, or probably most of you here have been using Dali and Midjourney, right? And you know that you write prompts. Well, I don't know, prompts are kind of weird in a way. They're, they're not, engine, prompt engineering is, it gives you a full sense of the objectivity of the way these work. They work through associative ways. I won't talk about it now. They are super complex. Um, but I write about, I write about 70 words in my, in my prompts. And they refer to lots of things, the lighting conditions, the hyper-realistic detailing, um, the, 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 uh, um, the rendering, all this, you know, lots and lots of words. But the actual words referring to architecture are minimal. In this prompt, the only words I used were ultra-contemporary minimalist house in the Austrian Alps. That's it. That's it. I didn't specify what the building would look like. Mid-journey did that. I didn't specify the mountains or the valley in the background. Mid-journey did that. I didn't specify the boulder in the foreground, the grass. Mid-journey did that. Mid-journey has learned the rules of composition. It has learned how to design. Mid-journey 5.2. Not all the time, of course, but when it gets it right, it gets it right. Or this one. I simply said, um, stainless steel um, contemporary kitchen. I didn't specify the painting in the background. Quite a nice painting. Or the bush outside, or the coffee maker on the side there, or the tap. None of that. Mid-journey did it all. It designed it all. It also has a sense of tectonics, of how materials might come together. And of course, incredible in its reflections. I didn't do any, I didn't say any of this. Mid-Journey did all of this, all this, you know. Um, the rendering and the reflections here are just astonishing. 
I don't know how long it would take a human to go and do all this, but this was done by Midjourney in three seconds. Um, Midjourney has hacked the operating system of architects. It has learned the rules of composition and it can design. So let's get back to Jeffrey Hinton. This is where it gets really black mirror, okay? Um, <laughs> this is, I mean, we need to pay attention to this guy because this is the godfather. He knows everything. This is the, one of the comments I made in my book is, I think I mentioned this, uh, AI has no, got no more capacity to think than a pocket calculator. Well, maybe, um, you know, and we've also had this, you know, this controversy. Um, there was a Google engineer who thought it was conscious and everyone was saying, nonsense, nonsense. He lost his job, not because he thought it was conscious, because he revealed you know, secrets, but everyone's not so sure about all these things just now. So here, I'm going to play you <coughs> Jeffrey Hinton. It made me realize that these digital intelligences have something we don't have that makes them much better. When one of them knows something, it can tell all the others that's what we don't have with people. So imagine you had 10,000 people, and imagine if when one person learned something, everybody knew it. You could learn a lot more stuff, right? right. And that's why things like ChatGPT knows like 10,000 times as much as any one person. It's because when you train it, there's lots of different copies looking at different bits of the data and learning stuff, and they can all combine what they learn instantly with a bandwidth of like trillions of bits. So can they think? Yes. So imagine the following scenario. I'm talking to chatbot, and we talk for a bit, and the answers it's given me seem a bit strange to me. And I suddenly realize that it thinks I'm a teenage girl. And I say, what demographic do you think I am? And it says it thinks I'm a teenage girl. Um, so the question is, when I said it's, I suddenly realize it thinks I'm a teenage girl. Was that a metaphorical use of the word think? Or is that just the same way as we use think? And I strongly believe that use of the word think, when I said it thinks I'm a teenage girl, was exactly the same way of using think as we do with people. And so that was enough to make you say, what, this has accelerated beyond my comfort level? I suddenly realized maybe they already are better, and making them more like me on the oral lets isn't the point. They're already better than us. They're a better way of doing learning. And if we make them bigger, they'll get much smarter than us. They already know more than any one person. I, I understand that things could go awry, but I still think that people hear the notion of danger and they dismiss it as hyperbole. I thought it was hyperbole for a long time because I thought these things were a long way off. I thought there will eventually be danger, but I thought um, focusing on it now is unnecessary because it will be 30 to 50 years before these things get more intelligent than us. But this combination of realizing that they might have a much better way of learning than we have, because they can share knowledge instantly. And seeing things like ChatGPT or Palm at Google that can explain why a joke is funny, made me realize these things are already pretty intelligent. And if they've got a better form of intelligence than ours, then it gets to be much more urgent. So, I mean, <clears throat> just to explain, I almost completely agree with, almost completely. So, I mean, uh, when he says joke, what happened, he used Palm, which is the Google equivalent of, of ChatGPT, and asked it to explain a joke to him, and explained it very well. And he figured, well, if he didn't explain a joke, it must understand the joke. That's a bit scary, right? So his position now is that AI has got a form of intelligence, albeit a different form of intelligence to biological intelligence. That is important. It's a different form of intelligence to human intelligence. Much different. No consciousness. But it is way, way superior, way superior. Um, so I totally agree. Where I disagree is that I don't think it can think. I mean, I think you have to use the word inverted, inverted commas, think. I, I don't think it thinks like humans. It thinks in different ways. We also think in, in different ways. I mean, critical theory is a very different way of theory to, to, to thinking to the kind of unselfconscious operations we do in everyday life. So I, I, anyway, but he's absolutely right. You will have Rari now. Um, also a bit black mirror. Um, here we go. This is the end of human history. The end of human dominated history. History will continue with somebody else in control. In five years, there'll be a technology that can make decisions independently 
and that can create new ideas independently. Maybe they'll be nice. Maybe they'll solve cancer and climate change, but we are not sure. I'm tending to think of it more in, in terms of, of, of really an alien invasion, an alien fleet of spaceships coming from planet Zircon or whatever, with, super, with highly intelligent beings. This is what we are facing, except that the aliens are not coming in spaceships from planet Zircon, they are coming from the laboratory. If the humans are divided among themselves and are in an, in an arms race, then it's bec it becomes almost impossible to contain this alien intelligence. So that's why I like the word alien intelligence. I don't suppose you read my book and saw my reference to alien, absolutely probably not, but it's such a useful term because it, it prevents you from anthropomorphizing it. But he's spot on. He's absolutely spot on about things, absolutely spot on. I, a bit, when I was uh, in Warsaw, which is where Poland is where Nicholas Copernicus came from, I gave a paper called The Second Copernican Revolution, and we know what the first one was. I mean, Copernicus basically saying the universe doesn't revolve around the Earth, right? The, the Earth revolves around the Sun, right? The Second Copernican Revolution is to say we are not the center of intelligent life or intelligent entities in the universe. We are not the center. Something else up there is much smarter than us, and our problem is we've been looking at it from a human perspective and looking at AI and say, ha, 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 it's not conscious, ha, ha, inferior. It's going to take a long time to catch up with us, isn't it? It's left us behind. We should look at human beings from the perspective of AI and realize we are like dumb creatures compared to this thing. So anyway, there we go. Um, <laughs> the accelerated future of AI. Well, I mean, I think you've got a sense of that from Jeffrey Hinton, acceleration. This, in my book, I, that I, I list out the four different levels or stages that they refer to. When will AI meet human level intelligence? When will we, will we reach the singularity? When will we reach, we reach artificial general intelligence? And when will we reach super intelligence? The problem is uh, that nobody agrees on anything. I mean, you get these different uh, estimates of when it's gonna happen. Um, Martin Ford has a book called Architects of Intelligence, nothing to do with architecture, by the way, um, uh, AI, basically. Um, and, and he asked everyone, and they eventually give, and then he averages it out 2019, when they, 2099, it's going to reach human level intelligence. Um, I wonder if people would revise their, would revise their view, view now in terms of um, chat, now chat GPT has been released. Um, arguably, it's probably already there, right? Um, the singularity, um, uh, well, I, what I found a little confusing, and maybe I got this wrong in my book, but the Ray Kurzweil gives the same notion of, 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 of date for the singularity as for artificial general, general intelligence. I'll describe what the singularity is in a moment. Artificial general intelligence is also a difficult term because it's used in two different ways. It's either used to refer to strong AI, AI, AI with consciousness, or it's used for general purpose AI. And arguably, with ChatGPT, we've already got that. Um, it can be used for many different sort of things. Um, so Rodney Brooks, way off. I mean, he's a roboticist, right? And, and that, that, okay, a problem. Not very good at robots, robotics yet. Um, uh, super intelligence, that is the final stage where give up, right? When AI starts inventing other AIs, that's the last invention humans need to make. So that's kind of... So, I mean, uh, I think what I... Um, in terms of the singularity, this idea there's going to be this absolute explosion of knowledge, um, at least that's the theory behind it. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm a little bit... I mean, I think things happen in different, in different areas at different times, right? Go, chess, forget it. It's already beaten us. Maybe there's some things that we'll still be good at, and I don't necessarily think this explosion is going to happen all together at one time, but the idea that it is going to all of a sudden happen and that we could see glimpses of something like that right now, okay? Um, I, I actually think that maybe um, uh, the, the way it's going to happen is we, we might even notice it at all. Um, so the other kind of theory that I, I talk about is what you might call the, the boiling the frog theory. Not that I ever would recommend boiling a frog, frog, nor have I ever boiled a frog, but the theory is if you want to boil a frog, don't drop the frog into a bottle, into a pan of boiling water because it will jump straight out. Um, I, that happens with shrimps in, in, in Tokyo, I know that, because they jump straight out. What you do is you put the frog in the water and it's a kind of tepid and you gradually raise the temperature and the frog doesn't notice until it's boiled. So would we even notice? Um, probably not. Um, anyway, um, 
Now, in terms of AGI, I mean, uh, just in terms of the consciousness question, this is a big issue. Um, uh, there, there was, there used to be a theory that the, 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 the smarter AI got, the nearer that would approach consciousness. I don't think that is the case at all. And these are just two quotes from Demis Asabi, CEO of DeepMind, and uh, Anil Seth, who's the amazing neuroscientist. What's interesting about these two is that Demis Asabi did a PhD in neuroscience before becoming the head of DeepMind, and Anil Seth did a PhD in AI before becoming a neuroscientist. You can have intelligence without consciousness, and you can have consciousness without human level intelligence. I agree. And then Anil said, consciousness and intelligence are entirely different things. You don't have to be smart to be suffer. You probably have to be alive. I don't think that AI is connected in any way, that, that intelligence is connected to, to consciousness. So that's my position. Max Tegmar, super smart guy. Very good book, this one. Neuroscience experiments suggest that many behaviors and brain regions are unconscious. We're not aware of what we're doing. Many things are just reflexes. A fly buzzes, we blink or something. And much of our conscious experience represents an after-the-fact summary of vast or great, vastly greater amounts of unconscious information. Of course, we, don't, we can't really talk about these things so we don't understand what's going on in the brain. It is a black box, but I, I, I agree with that. Um, and then this thing about meaning, <coughs> that we just project meaning onto the universe. The universe has got no meaning. What, who are we kidding, right? Um, uh, and then this final comment, which I really as well. This suggests that as we humans prepare to be humbled by ever greater uh, smarter machines, we take comfort by in being homo sentients, not homo sapiens. Um, and then Yuval Harari, uh, which I, 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 I totally agree with him here again, there might be several alternative ways leading to superintelligence, only some of which pass through the straits of consciousness. Which of the two is really important, intelligence or consciousness? Intelligence is mandatory, but consciousness is optional. He talks about how um, a Google car, of course we know Google cars and self-driving cars crash. And we all joke about it, things, but they're gonna get better and they're not gonna crash anymore. But there was a case where a human driver crashed into a Google car. Now, this was the point he was making. Self-driving cars get better, but humans will never not get distracted. We'll never got, so do we need consciousness? Probably not. I mean, frankly, you know, if my toaster makes good toast, I don't care if it's conscious or not. If AI generates buildings, I don't care if it's conscious or not, as long as it produces good design. And all my students who come and say, but I put so much of my own emotions and, and, and into the thing. Who cares? If your design is bad, I'm sorry, I don't care. It sounds a brutal thing to say. Who cares? You know, you know whatever. So my view is, I don't think consciousness is anything you should worry about. Maybe it even could be a, a hindrance. So anyway, there we go. Superintelligence. So this is the kind of the scary side. And, and Nick Bostrom wrote this a long time ago. I don't know if it's necessarily true anymore. Uh, but it's a definition. And in any intellect that greatly exceeds the cognitive performance of humans in virtually all domains of interest. Um, and so on and so on and so on and so on. Um, I don't think it's going to colonize other planets. I don't think it's going to transform the environment. I mean. It doesn't have any intentionality, first of all, it doesn't pertain to the domain of the physical. You know, you can control a robot with AI, but it, I mean, it's like, it's like the brain, right? Then the arm is the robotic arm. It's, it's not going to do it in itself. It's got to do it anyway, whatever. Um, this, uh, then he makes these three definitions of this, and I think this kind of, in terms of accelerated landscape, is important. I mean, speed is superintelligence. Um, and uh, I mean, the mistake here, it says, um, uh, he said the bottom of it, a system that is at least as fast as a human mind and vastly quantitatively smarter. Well, actually, it's way faster than the human mind. Are you kidding me? Can anyone play 20 games of Go against themselves in one second? No, no. Right, so forget it. Okay, so, but, I mean, okay, this was written a while back, okay? So the problem has been, I think, that we've been thinking in terms of what's called Moore's Law. And back in the 60s, Gordon Moore, who's an industrialist, made this observation. The number of, of, of transistors on a circuit board would double every year, and then the, the price would come down by half. He later revised that to two years, but basically the principle's the same. It is exponential. In other words, instead of one, two, three, four, you go one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, whatever. And that, we've, we've used that to kind of think, well, that's interesting. It's kind of, uh, and I, the, thing, the mistake is, well, why would it be if it be two? That doesn't seem to make any sense to me. Um, and, and that's been the model we've been thinking of when we think about accelerating landscapes. Oh yes, this is what's happening, right? Well, okay, first of all, it's going faster. Um, this is the kind of point that Sundar Pichai made. Uh, um, uh, uh, 
the scale of the, is far outpacing Moore's law. These are the large language models. They're far outpacing Moore's law in terms of what they're doing. But I think this is completely the wrong model to think about because that's about the market, about the technology and how the prices come down and so on. It's how the things learn. This is what Jeffrey Hinton's talking about that I think is important. I think the model we should do, look, do better looking at is, is this one, which is to say, this is COVID. And, and the famous thing in COVID was the, the R factor, right? How the transmission of, if you could transmit to more than one person, that was dangerous, right? Less than one person, get below one, it was okay. We're talking, in Jeffrey Hinton's thing, about a thousand, right? One computer to a thousand. So what the hell would that do on this graph? I mean, this is the scary thing, the speed at which it's transferring information, it's learning. That is the accelerated landscape we've got to deal with. Not Moore's law, that's completely wrong. This is what we're talking about. That's why we're going to be left, we are left behind already, we're going to be left further and further behind. So. Let me, I'll just wrap up with a few kind of comments, <laughs> comments from the UK. I don't know who's, this was such, so when I was a kid, I, this was like, you know, uh, um, this is the thing we all watched. You know, and Douglas Adams was at St. John's College, I was in Emmanuel College, Cambridge, and it was really the thing. And those of you who've seen this movie uh, are probably aware of this supercomputer called Deep Thought, right? Um, and uh, it's kind of interesting because they wanted to, uh, give it the answer to life, the universe, and everything. And um, it takes 10 million years, and it comes up with the answer 42. I think, oh, oh. <laughs> what was the question? Um, a bit like Cedric Price, technology is the answer, but what is the question? So they then take, I think it takes another 9 million years, um, and uh, the idea is it kind of comes up with the the question, which is, what is six times eight, which of course is not 42, but <laughs> this is, uh, for Elon Musk, this is a book about philosophy. This is his favorite book. It's a book about philosophy because you have to ask the right question to get the right answer. So it's his favorite book. <laughs> now, I personally think that what is ChatGPT doing? It's sifting through all the data. I think it's got the answer to life, the meaning, the meaning of life, the universe, everything already. Already, it's got, it, it knows all this, and um, although if you probably ask it, it'll probably give the answer probably too, but it knows all this. Um, the difference is that whereas Deep, Deep Thought took 10 million years to come up with the answer, ChatGPT was in three seconds. This is why we should be totally terrified, except if you read the back cover of the book, don't panic. Um, um, I'm going to finish off with another Brit, uh, Arthur C. Clarke, who is absolutely a genius. What an amazing guy. And, uh, um, sorry about the Arabic subtitles. <laughs> um, he's going to speak in English, don't worry. Um, uh, and this was in 1964. 1964. And he was predicting this. You cannot really make comparisons between, between AI and, and the brain because both are black boxes. But you can speculate. And if you speculate in an intelligent way, you get it right. It's as though he's talking about exactly what Jeffrey Hinton was mentioning in 2023, and he's talking about this in 1964. Here's uh, Arthur C. Clarke. However, the most intelligent inhabitants of that future world won't be men or monkeys. They'll be machines, the remote descendants of today's computers. Now, the present-day electronic brains are complete morons. But this will not be true in another generation. They will start to think, and eventually they will completely outthink their makers. Is this depressing? I don't see why it should be. We superseded the Cro-Magnon and Neanderthal men, and we presume we're an improvement. I think we should regard it as a privilege to be stepping stones to higher things. I suspect that organic or biological evolution has about come to its end, and we are now at the beginning of inorganic or mechanical evolution, which will be thousands of times swifter. Uh, he was spot on. So, I mean, maybe to finish up, I don't think, I mean, he's a bit of optimism there, right? And, you know, I think what is so interesting about the human beings is our, what, what neuroscientists call our plastic brain. We a very, we can adapt to these technologies and tools and start thinking creatively. What I find interesting is what not whether the, the, whether the tools are creative or not, because they're not, but the creative way, if we can use that term, people are going to use it. I think new things are going to need to emerge. Well, we're going to lose our jobs, but let's not worry about that, okay? 
but the new things are going to begin to emerge, and it's actually, we'll, we will keep calm and carry on. <laughs> so just finally, I mean, one of the things about this world is, is that it is changing so rapidly. Angelica keeps feeding me information about what's happened today. Holy oh, shit, <laughs> we're like three times as fast as what happened. Accelerated landscape, that's what we're dealing with. And the only way you can deal with this actually is, in terms of AI, is have a single platform where you get, there are about six people in the world know what's going on, right? George Geeter and a few other people, Harvard and whatever, you know? So we bring them together in a platform and that's probably the only way you can, you can do this. And we also, of course, we have Spanish teams as well. So I would say if you want to find out what's going on, have a look at the Digital Futures tutorials and things um, that are under digitalfutures.international and you click on that and you get to the YouTube thing and there are a bunch of things. There are an incredibly interesting series of things on AI, neuroscience and so on. I've given you a hint about Anil Seth and, and Demis Vosavis. That is the area for theory. It's unbelievably fascinating. Things are happening and I'm like, this is an amazing time to be alive. Amazing time to be alive, especially for anyone interested in theoretical ideas and so on. So it's all happening there. Have a look at that support our digital futures team because we are trying to revolutionize education by making things free for everyone. Education, we believe, should be a human right and not a privilege of the wealthy, and that's why we're doing what we're doing. It's all here, so um, uh, anyway, don't be terrified. Um, keep calm and carry on. Thank you.